glory here and hereafter by Horatius Bonar. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Psalm chapter 30, verse 5. Point 1. Descriptions of Glory The riches of his glory, says the apostle in one place, Romans chapter 9, verse 23. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, writes he in another, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Strange expressions, these. They carry us up to a height of such infinite glory and joy that we feel bewildered and overwhelmed. Just as there are riches of grace, riches of mercy, riches of love, and riches of wisdom, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, Romans chapter 9 verse 23, and chapter 11 verse 33, so there are riches of glory, glory in abundance, such as shall make us rich indeed. Glory spreads over our whole inheritance, so that we shall have all and abound. Philippians chapter 4 verse 18. Nay, this glory is that which God counts his riches, that which he reckons the perfection of his inheritance, the very essence of its beauty and its blessedness. The glorious liberty of the children of God, writes the apostle, Romans chapter 8 verse 21, thereby telling us that there is glory which is the peculiar property of the saints, a glory of which they can say it is our own, thereby marking it out from the glory of all other creatures. This glory contains liberty. It sets free those who possess it. Corruption had brought with it chains and bondage. Glory brings with it divine liberty. It is not the liberty that brings the glory. It is the glory that brings the liberty, blessed liberty, freedom from every bondage, not only the bondage of corruption, sin and death, but the bondage of sorrow. For is not sorrow a bondage? Are not its chains sharp and heavy? From this bondage of tribulation, the glory sets us eternally free. It is the last fetter save that of the grave, that is struck from our bruised limbs, but when it is broken, it is broken forever. And this liberty which the glory brings to us is one that shall extend to the unconscious creation around us. We brought that creation into bondage, covering it with dishonor and making it the prey of corruption. It now groans and travails under this sore bondage. But as it has shared our bondage, it is also to share our liberty, and that same glory which brings liberty to us shall introduce the oppressed and dishonored creation into the same blessed freedom. O oh, longed-for consummation! O oh, joyful hope! O oh, welcome day when the bringer of this glory shall arrive, and the voice be heard from heaven. Behold, I make all things new. Revelation chapter 21 verse 5. Nor is it liberty only that this glory contains in it, but power also, as it is written, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. This glory has even now a power giving energy whereby we are strengthened to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Colossians chapter 1 verse 11. Thus rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 2. We are fitted for all manner of tribulation and endurance. Though still among the things not seen, it not only flings forward a radiance that brightens our path, but sheds down a strength that enables us to run with patience the race that is set before us. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. And so in an unholy world, we walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 12, having that prayer fulfilled in us, the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus Christ. After that, ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. First Peter chapter five, verse 10. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. An indwelling Christ is our earnest, our pledge, 
our hope of glory. Having him, we have all that is his, whether present or to come. He is the link that binds together the here and the hereafter. We died with him. We went down into the tomb with him. We rose with him, and our life is now hid with him in God. But when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. The joy with which we rejoice is a joy unspeakable and full of glory, or more literally, a glorified joy. A joy such as Paul had when caught up into paradise. A joy such as John's when placed in vision within sight of the celestial city. A joy into whose very essence the thoughts of glory enter. A joy that makes the soul which possesses it feel as if it were already compassed about with glory. As if it had come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 23. The glorious gospel of Christ, says the apostle, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And again, the glorious gospel of the blessed God, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. Or more literally, the gospel of the glory of Christ. That is, the good news about the glory of Christ and the good news about the glory of the blessed God. As it is the gospel of the kingdom, or good news about the kingdom, that is preached, so it is good news about the glory. This good news God has sent, and is still sending, to this world. In believing them and receiving God's record concerning the glory, we become partakers of it. And continue to be so if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14. This good news most fully meets our case, however sad or sinful, and sheds light into our souls even in their darkest and most desponding hours. Point two, suffering. Our present light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17. So that glory is not merely the issue of tribulation, but in some sense, its product. Tribulation is the soil, and glory is the blossom and the fruit. The soil is rough and unseemingly, but the produce is altogether perfect. It may seem strange that out of such a field there should spring verdure so fresh and fruit so divine, yet we know that such is the case. How much we owe to that unlikely soil. Not only do all things work together for good to us, but they as truly work together for glory. Faith lays hold of this and prizes tribulation, nay, glories in it. So realizing the joy as to lose sight of the sorrow, save as contributing to the joy so absorbed in the glory as to forget the shame, accepting in so far as it is the present and precursor of the glory. Most needful is it when we should realize these prospects, these glimpses that God has given us of what we are yet to be. It is not merely lawful to do so for the relief of the laden spirit, but it is most vitally important to do so for the health of our soul, for our growth in grace, and for enabling us to press on with cheerful energy in the path of service towards God, and of usefulness to our brother saints or fellow men. The man of sorrows had joy set before him, and it was for this that he endured the cross, despising the shame. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. He needed it, and so do we. For he who sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. He found in it strength for the bearing of the cross and the endurance of the shame. So may we, for as the path he trod is the same that is given to us to tread in, so the strength is to be found where our forerunner found it. There is joy in store for us, even as for him, joy not only like his, but his very own joy. John chapter 15 verse 11. 
This makes us willing to bear the cross in all its weight and sharpness. Nay, it lightens it so that oft times we do not feel its pressure. We can glory both in the cross and the shame. We have less of these than he had, and we have all his consolation, all his joy to the full. When this is lost sight of, selfish melancholy often fastens on us. We brood over our griefs till they engross us entirely, to the shutting out of all else. We magnify them, we spread them out and turn them over on every side in order to find out the gloomiest. We take credit to ourselves for endurance and thus feed our pride and self-importance. We fret under them and at the same time grow vain at being the objects of so much sympathy, at having so many eyes upon us and so many words of comfort addressed to us. Nothing can be more unhealthy than this state of soul, nor more unlike that in which God expects a saint to be. It shuts us into the narrow circle of self. It contracts as well as distorts our vision. It vitiates our spiritual tastes. It lowers our spiritual tone. It withers and shrivels up our spiritual being. Unfitting us for all offices of calm and gentle love, nay, hindering the right discharge of plain and common duty. It is in itself a sore disease and is the source of other diseases without number. Point three, God's solution to despair. Letter A, Christ versus self. To meet this unhealthy tendency, God seeks to draw us out of ourselves. He does so in holding up the cross for us to look upon and be healed. But he also does this by exhibiting the crown and throne. The cross does not annihilate man's natural concern for self, but it loosens our thoughts from this by showing us upon the cross one to whose care we may safely entrust self with all its interests and in whose pierced hands it will be far better provided for than in our own. So the vision of the glory does not make away with self, but it absorbs it and elevates it by revealing the kingdom in which God has made such blessed and enduring provision for us as to make it appear worse than folly in us to brood over our case and make self the object of our sad and anxious care. If we are to have glory as surely and as cheaply as the lilies have their clothing, or the ravens their food, why be so solicitous about self? Or why think about self at all, save to remember and to rejoice that God has taken all our concerns into his own keeping for eternity? Letter B. Think upon glory. Thus, God beguiles us away from our griefs by giving us something else to muse over, something more worthy of our thoughts. He allures us from the present, where all is dark and uncomely, into the future, where all is bright and fair. He takes us by the hand and leads us, as a father his child, out from the gloomy region which we are sadly pacing, with our eye upon the ground, bent only upon nourishing our sorrows, into fields where all is fresh and Eden-like, so that, ere we are aware, joy, or at least the faint reflection of it, has stolen into our hearts and lifted up our heavy eyes." He would not have us abiding always in the churchyard or sitting upon the turf beneath which love is buried, as if the tomb to which we are clinging were our hope, not resurrection beyond it. He would have us to come forth, and having allured us away from that scene of death, he binds us look upwards, upbraiding us with our unbelief and folly, and saying to us, They whom you love are yonder. Ere long he who is their life and yours shall appear, and you shall rejoin each other, each of you embracing not a weeping, sickly fellow mortal, but a glorified saint set free from pain and sin." There is nothing more healthy and genial for the soul than these anticipations of the morning and of morning glory. They are not visionary, save in the sense in which faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. 
They transfuse the life of heaven through our frame, either on the one hand making our languid pulse to beat more swiftly, or on the other, our feverish pulse to throb more calmly and evenly. They act as regulators of the soul in its wild and inconsistent movements, neither allowing us to sink too low nor to soar too high. They tend to steady our extreme impulses by acting as a counterpoise to the weight of grief that so crushes us with its pressure. They withdraw us from self and self-broodings. They widen the circle of our sympathies and throw back into the distance the fence of exclusiveness that, in times of suffering, we are apt to throw up around ourselves. They check mere sentimentality and forbid us to indulge the flow of grief for its own luxury. They prohibit morbid gloom, which loves to shun out society and chooses loneliness. They fill us with energy for facing the toils and with ready courage for braving the dangers of the night. They animate us with the calm but indomitable confidence of hope, a hope that expands and brightens as its object approaches. The morning... That is our watchword. It gives the hue to life, imparting color to that which is colorless and freshening that which is faded. It is the sum and term of our hopes. Nothing else will do for us or for our world, a world over which the darkness gathers thicker as the years run out. Stars may help to make the sky less gloomy, but they are not the sun. And besides, clouds have now wrapped them so that they are no longer visible. The firmament is almost without a star. Torches and beacon lights avail not. They make no impression upon the darkness. It is so deep, so real, so palpable. We might give up all for lost. We were not assured that there is a sun and that it is hastening to rise. The church's pilgrimage is nearly done, yet she is not less a pilgrim as its end draws nigh. Nay, more so, the last stage of the journey is the dreariest for her. Her path lies through the thickest darkness that the world has yet felt. It seems as if it were only by the fitful blaze of conflagrations that we can now shape our way. It is the sound of falling kingdoms that is guiding us onward. It is the fragments of broken thrones lying across our path that assures us that our route is the true one and that its end is near. That end, the morning with its songs, and in that morning, a kingdom, and in that kingdom, glory, and in that glory, the everlasting rest, the Sabbath of eternity. This concludes the reading of Glory Here and Hereafter by Horatius Bonar. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button so that videos like these can spread to more people. Thank you so much for following along, and we'll catch you in the next video.